But uh, I want to talk to you about false brethren. The Apostle Paul used that twice. False brethren. And I want to talk about that a little bit here uh, tonight. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd be with us now and help us. Guide us in the Word of God. Show us, Lord, the truths of it. And uh, help us to receive them. Lord, help us to understand that this thing is true. There are false brethren. The Apostle Paul spoke of them. And what they can do, the damage that they can cause, and what they can do, Lord. And help us to be diligent in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 4, the Bible says, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul talks about this in verse number 26. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it. You can if you want to. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In perils among false brethren, he says. Notice that that all these things are dangerous. You know what that means? You remember when the, when the, when the Apostle Paul said, this know also that perilous times shall come? We're here. Amen. But he says those are dangerous times, horrible times. He's talking about these men. He's saying the same thing. There are, he said he had perils among false brethren. These were people that said that they were Christians, but they weren't. You mean there's actually people that say that they're saved and they're not? Yeah, I was one of them for a really long time. So, yeah, I know. Amen. Brother Paul gave a testimony that he, if you would have asked him if he was a Christian for a really long time, he would have said, sure, I'm a Christian. But he was lost. Amen. Some of you here the same way. You lived your lives and said that you were saved and thought that you were saved and were deceived and then figured out that you weren't saved. God revealed that unto you. That's not a bad thing, by the way. That's a good thing. Amen. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Some people think that's terrible. I don't think it's terrible. I think it's, I think it's, it's wonderful. And I think you always, your children need to understand that's a wonderful thing. They understand that. Hey, some of them may make a profession at a young age and may turn out that that they admit, hey, listen, I was never under any conviction. I was never born again. I need to get saved. You better not make it hard for them. You better let God work on their hearts. Amen? Too many parents today trying to work on the children's heart themselves. Now, we're to nurture that. We're to preach that. But you know what? You better leave the saving up to the Holy Ghost. You better leave that conviction, that saving up. You preach the word, but you better leave the decisions up to God and them. Don't you try to do it yourself. You create a lot of false converts and give people a lot of false hope. Well, Paul was talking about false brethren here. He gives an account, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 15. And, I mean, all these are just like cross-references here. Isn't that King James Bible amazing? It's, there's just so much information there. The Acts is the history book, amen? It's the Acts of the Apostles, it's a history book. Tells what really happened. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had, had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way to the church by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversions of the, of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. 
And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to be circumcised them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So these are who you call the Judaizers. We'll get to them in just a little while, okay? But the Apostle Paul, he wrote and warned us about false brethren. We're going to talk about the Judaizers, okay? The um, uh, the uh, the Judaizers are none other than you have them in, today. They're called the Hebrew Roots Movement. Okay, you have those there. We'll talk about the Hebrew Roots Movement, and we'll talk about these Judaizers here in a second. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, but the first thing we notice is that false brethren are dangerous. Paul says in perils of false brethren, they're dangerous now and for eternity. I believe Paul was many times in danger of these men who tried to bring down, bring him down through temporal means. They tried to raise up crowds against him and he was stoned and he was beaten many times he suffered. But I believe, like the Apostle Paul's time, that there is coming a time again where this is happening. Now, it's always happened in the history of the churches. It has always taken place where there would be people that would be spies, so to speak. There would be false brethren that would enter in. There would be false prophets that would enter in. But I believe as we enter these end times that we're in right now, we are going to see a rise of that more and more. And Jesus said the same thing. Matthew chapter 24, please, in verse number 9. Matthew chapter 24. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. You ever seen this? I have. You watch people, you hold to this King James Bible, and you hold to the truth, and its authority, and people will hate you for it. They'll betray you for it. They'll stab you in the back for it and because of it. Says that, he says here, that and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now turn to John chapter 16, please. John chapter 16. Verse number 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Remember how we talked about that in that message? Baptist, a prophecy of persecution. How every time the reformers killed the Baptists, what did they say to them? That they were doing God's work. They were doing God's service. And I submit to you that there will be many, many people that are that are deceived by the Antichrist. And if you and I are alive and remain here at that time, I do believe, you may disagree with this, but I do believe that we will see Him on this earth if we are alive at that point. I do believe that. And I also believe that there will be false brethren that will be there to try to trip up the saved brethren. They will be there to try to turn them in in their congregations. You say, when has that ever happened before, preacher? Germany. Europe. They had spies. They had people that would go in there. They had brethren that would go in there. False brethren that would go in there and they would turn in those churches. They would turn in those Jews. They would turn anybody they could against them. How about the Iron Curtain? You don't think that ever happened in, in the Soviet Union, in Russia, in those places? Why do you think they were careful who they baptized? I talked to a Ukrainian pastor before and he told me, and, and, and when I talked to him, his, his, his grandfather was a, his grandfather trained in a Baptist church over in, in New York, and he was sent back over to the Ukraine to start churches behind the Iron Curtain there. And the, and he said that, that they would capture him, they would capture him, and they would ask him, we want the list of the people that were saved? No. We want the list of those that were baptized. Let us see the list. And he wouldn't give it to him, so he sat in jail. Why? He was a shepherd. He wasn't going to give up the sheep. So he sat in prison. He escaped many times, went through a lot. 
was a fascinating story. Um, it was a, a couple Ukrainian Baptists we helped uh, organize outside of 501c3 just a few years ago. They contacted me, told me his story. I was fascinated by his story of his grandfather. What his grandfather, his grandfather started, I, I think he must have said 20 or so churches over there. Traveling through, in and out. I mean, he was just like, you know, like a, like a modern day apostle there, you know, just traveling through there and hiding and hiding out and hiding his, his converts. Not giving up information about their converts that they wanted to know who was being baptized. Because Christianity is an enemy to the beast. Understand that? Biblical Christianity is an enemy to the governments of the world. It always has been. Why? Because I say so? No, because they made it so. Read Psalm 2. We don't look at them as enemies. They might be enemies of the gospel, but we don't look at them like that. We, we pray for our enemies. We want to reach them for Christ, but they will look at the church as an enemy. Amen? Right, because you won't be deceived by the beast. You won't wonder after the beast. Amen. I believe this, folks. I'm preaching this because I believe that there's going to come a time, and there already is a time, when false brethren come in and creep into churches and try to hurt them, spy on them. Amen. I believe that. Oh, you must be a conspiracy guy. I sure am. I find them all over this King James Bible. They're all over the place. Yeah, it's a sound system in there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Brother Paul. Turn the jamming signal on. But, uh, anyway. Um, no, they're there, yeah. But all, we understand that's exactly what's going to take place. It is. It has taken place. Listen, just because you and I have been blessed to live in this American bubble of liberty, and thank God that we do, but the bubble will be popped sooner or later. And the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Amen. Hey, I believe the Bible. I believe it's true. And they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that they do with God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. Now Mark chapter 13, he says this, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death. And the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You know, that's why it's important that a church follows discipline and order and the ordinances. You understand that? The ordinances, you understand that? It's important. Why is it important? Because false brethren creep in. Unawares, that's why. That's right, it's a safeguard to the local church. It's a safeguard to the local church. And that's the way God intended it to be. Acts chapter 5 and verse number 13. There ought to be great fear for somebody to join a local church, just like there was in Acts 5.13. And of the resters, no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. What happened? Well, God punished Ananias and Sapphira, and they died right there. And, the, and nobody wanted to join the church that wasn't serious about it. Amen? You want to see something? You let persecution come, and you'll see how many people want to be a part of a church. They might be a part of the big blanket Roman Catholicism one world church. By the way, I'm going to talk about that on Sunday. Why Baptists need to preach against Rome. I'm going to preach a couple messages on that. Why Baptists need to preach against Rome. It'll be interesting. Hang on for the ride. It'll be fun. Amen. That's right. We should be looking very intentively on who joins our churches 
and who we take into our confidence. Because there's a peril with false brethren. There's a danger with them. Why? Because they won't hold on like you will. You've got Christ in your heart and you've been sealed under the day of redemption. You can go through a lot even unto death because He's worthy. But He's not worth it to them. Because they've never received the love of the truth that they might be saved. But they're going to receive strong delusion. Why do you think it says the father will turn, or the children will turn in their parents and betray their parents? What do you think that means by that? That they, they fall for the deception and they're not born again. They were never saved. So they don't care about your God. Because it isn't their God. And they follow and believe a lie. That's the danger. You know, how many of our churches are full of false brethren? Maybe they're not carrying around a false doctrine, but they're not saved. They're not born again. And your children grow up in many churches watching hypocrisy and fake lives of people who live for their own flesh and have no power of God in their life and don't desire anything. What does that do to young people when they grow up? It certainly doesn't help them, does it? So there's a danger with that. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, number two, false brethren here in the Scriptures are dealing with, I believe, the Judaizers. Number one, he's dealing with them because they were the dangerous ones to him. They were the ones that were after him. False brethren here were the Hebrew, what I would call the modern day Hebrew roots movement. They are what would be false brethren. And why is that? Because there are men today that are trying to add the, the law of God to justification. They're trying to add that. They're trying to add the ceremonial laws of Judaism to justification. That you cannot be saved unless you keep the, 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 the either the moral or the law of God, or the uh, ceremonial law of God. Now we don't believe that. We don't believe that at all. Matter of fact, you can't keep it. Amen? You can't keep it. You should keep it. God still requires you to keep it. And only the blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness. See the difference? I'm looking at you and I'm telling you, you couldn't keep the Sabbath if you wanted it. Oh, yes, I could. Oh, no, you couldn't. Because your mind drifts off somewhere else. When this book is preached, and you go somewhere else, and you're not there. So you didn't keep it. Think about that one. Got a bunch of Sabbath people out there saying you've got to keep the Sabbath. Really? But you ain't never kept it in your life, and neither did any Jew. How do you know that? I know that from the Scriptures, because Jesus, when He came to the Sermon on the Mount, He said, well, if you've done it in your heart, you've done it already. You're guilty of it already. It's the heart, man. And God wants to be enthroned on your heart. Not through types and shadows and ceremonies. But it took the blood of Jesus to secure them. Don't you dare get confused when preachers, when we preach repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is not a work of man. It is not keeping the law. It is not trying to earn favor with God. Repentance is a broken, contrite man sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ begging Him to be saved. That's what it is. It's understanding my wicked condition before God. It's realizing it. It's confessing it. And saying, Lord, save me, I perish. And it's a work of the Holy Ghost of God. Wrought on by the conviction or the reproving work of the Holy Spirit. Some of these same men today, these Hebrew roots men or false brethren crept in. Try to get you to believe that the law of Moses can be followed and obeyed and you should be obeying it and following it. They add this to say the name of Jesus must be said as Yeshua. You must say Yeshua, otherwise God doesn't hear you. Because God apparently doesn't know English. 
Apparently he doesn't understand any other language besides the originals. Well, I'm just telling you that's what they believe. And you'd be surprised because there is, because fundamentalism, the movement has destroyed churches so much that these Hebrew roots movement actually they stand on something even though they're wrong. But they stand on something. And people are tired of wishy-washiness. I get it. I understand that. I get the zeal and the motivation for it. I understand it. But anyway, they, so they say that Jesus, God, Yeshua, and 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 uh, I forget the other one. I can't think of how they pronounce the other one. No, I just can't think of it. Well, that's horrible. I think. They don't say Jehovah. They say something else. Man, anybody remember that one? I don't I don't remember it. Yahweh, that's it. Yahweh. They say, you gotta say Yahweh. And you gotta say Yeshua. And I said, well, how come when they say like John, they don't say Yan then? Why, why don't they say Yames then? Well, what's, why, why, why do they say, why do they do that? Why do they, why can't they say like all the J's like that? Why, it doesn't make any sense. But it's just that one right there. So what are they saying? What they're saying to you is if you don't say something right, you can't be saved. What is that? It's witchcraft. It's exactly what it is. You might as well just draw a circle around and use an incantation. Because that's exactly what you're saying. You're saying that if you don't say something right, then God doesn't understand you. Well, listen, my Bible says that the Holy Ghost of God intercedes for my prayer life because I don't even know what to pray. And... They have a God that they've formed with their own hands and they've stuck in a pocket. And that's who they've made God to be. Because uh, apparently their God is not all knowing and their God needs somebody to flatter him in order for him to believe them. Or you've got to say it this way because God has to be flattered. I hope you understand that in your prayer life, God doesn't need you to whisper sweet little nothings to him. Okay. God is all real. He is all God. He does not need you to talk to him like you're trying to romance him. Okay? You talk to God like you would a friend like Abraham did. You cry out to him as you need him. You don't have to give all these fancy uh, titles and names and all these other things. God wants your heart. That's what he cares about. He wants your obedience. <coughs> But these false Hebrew roots people, they add the ceremonial law of the Sabbath day. They don't believe in the true grace of God. In Galatians 2.10, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles when they were come. He withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. And other Jews disassembled them likewise with him in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin. God forbid, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if the grace of God... Oops, I lost my place here. Thank you. I do not frustrate the grace of God for righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You will notice that he's dealing with adding justific adding anything to justification. Repentance is a condition of the heart. It doesn't add anything to justification. 
you will never be able to believe in Christ until your heart is broken over who you are. And that will not happen unless God's Holy Spirit is speaking to you and dealing with you through His Word. It won't happen. Why? You will never see your need for Him until He shows you from His Word. And He speaks to your heart. Paul said in Philippians 3, 9, He said, And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. You know, you aren't even saved by your own puny faith. You're saved by the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ. It's my little faith that reaches out and Christ, and I'm saved by the faith of Christ. Amen. Why? Because Christ is the only one that could ever please God. Do you understand that? When people, they misunderstand and they misapply some of these scriptures. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me as a people. What does that mean? It means that God writes the law on your heart. God writes the law on your heart when you get saved. And it's there, written there. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the 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 uh, all all the law of Moses. I'm talking about the law of God. I'm not talking about not not uh, not uh, sowing your field with diverse seeds. By the way, that is a spiritual lesson, though. But it's not it's not a physical lesson for us. I'm not talking about uh, certain meats or or not eating certain meats. Because what did that what did that certain come from James? And what did he say? He said that they shouldn't uh, eat things strangled. They shouldn't fornicate. They shouldn't do so. To be saved? No, because they're saved. They shouldn't have that testimony. They should abstain from those things. But as far as keeping the law, they weren't required to do that. Did you know that he didn't say anything about keeping the Sabbath either? Now, why if they were... if if, if Remember, what's going on here? This is a good lesson for the Hebrew Roots people. What's go, what's going on here? What's what's going on is that... Is that the, these these Pharisees are telling these Gentile Christians that they must keep the law of, in order to be saved. So they must be circumcised. They must keep the Sabbath. They must do all of these things in order to be saved. To earn salvation. Yeah, these, they're adding works to justification. That is the true definition of a legalist. Now, to look at a man after he is saved... After he has said that Jesus Christ saved his soul, and he has the Holy Ghost of God in him, and says, now it's time to live for God. That's not work salvation. You're speaking to a man that says, hey, I'm saved. Okay, well, God says if you're saved, there's fruit in your life. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's not called a bunch of works. I've heard a bunch of pastors preach this before. Well, after you get saved, then you're going to have a desire to always go soul winning. So you're going to go soul winning, 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 soul winning. Your whole life is soul winning. That's pretty much the extent of everything that they teach you. Soul winning, 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 soul winning. I'm sorry. I heard it so much in fun. I've heard it so much in fundamental churches. That's soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. That's 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 what it is. I mean, that's all they. That's the only thing that these people can ever tell you. I, I heard it. I heard it from Jack Hiles. Soul winning will take care of anything in your church. Take care of any problem in your life. Soul winning will just do it all. Well, that's actually witchcraft. I mean, that's not even biblical. What do you mean? Soul winning will not take care of fornication. I'm sorry, but it won't. And soul winning is not going to feed your family. You got to get your you got to get yourself out there and go to work. Okay, soul winning ain't going to feed your family. All right. I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. Any any problem in a church, he said, can be fixed with soul winning. What is that? What well, first of all, it's foolish. I've heard him say that all that soul winning can cover sins. I mean, so you know what they did? They had a bunch of fornicating, rotten little devils in their church. Is what they had. 
And they let them do all their little fornicating and rotten stuff. Why? Because they went soul winning. That's why. <coughs> I know I'm not popular for saying things like that, but that's okay. It's the truth. And it's worth saying. Amen. In Acts chapter 15, we see here they were trying this. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received at the church. So, so listen, there was a problem. Where these Pharisees stood up and said, hey, you've got to keep the law. So what did Paul do? Paul looked at Peter to his face and said, hey, no, what are you doing? You can't tell these guys they've got to keep the law in order to be saved. I mean, you're an apostle. What are you doing? You can't tell people that. You know that's wrong. You know that's not right. So he took it before the church. He went to James and the elders and he took it before the church. And they said, of course not. What did they say? Let's see what they said here. It says here, now therefore, why? Okay, he says, uh, the Apostle Paul, and there, and there, there had been, in verse number 7, Acts chapter 15, verse number 7, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know how that God, uh, how, how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by the mouth of God should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost as he did unto us. Why? Because of faith. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after that, after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first had, did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof. And I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doth, doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Amen. Same thing you would tell a convert, wouldn't you? I mean, don't be going to hang out at, the, at, at, at Baal's altar anymore. I mean, that's not a hangout place for you to go hang around. So don't go, don't go back to these wicked places that are having false. Don't eat after their temple sacrifices because, you know, it's gonna, your Jewish brethren are gonna get all, I mean, not temple, but, but the false sacrifices. Your Jewish brethren get all messed up, so don't do that. And hey, don't be fornicating now, you're saved. Don't be living a wicked life like that. Fornication's wicked, God hates it. Don't be doing that. Makes sense, doesn't it? I, I mean, that's, He's just telling them, hey, listen, morally, you've got to live for God. You don't, you're saved now. You don't do that. You don't live this way. That's, I mean, that's it. Why? Why did he tell them that? Why did he told them that? Because he didn't want them to think that they could be a bunch of lawless, wicked people that didn't morally have to live, live for God because they were saved. Oh, we got the Holy Ghost. We can do what we want to. No, he's telling them you can't do that. You know, you got to live for God. You got to do right. Anyway, so, so, uh, so he talks again about justification and he makes sure they understand that. And they did rejoice. You know, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> they did rejoice because of that. We are, so you and I understand that, that, that we are justified by faith in Christ, more specifically by the faith of Christ. You can't add anything to that, okay? You can't add any works to Christ's sacrifice. To tell a man he must repent and believe the gospel is not adding works to salvation. It's not lordship salvation. It's not, well, I mean, he is Lord, so whatever you want to call that, but, but, um, it's, it's not. He is Lord. He is, he is God overall. Amen. And, you know, to tell a man that he must repent is exactly, would Paul contradict himself if he was saying that? Did, did, is there anything in here that says that repentance is Judaizing? No. 
He didn't even mention repentance here. Why? He didn't have to. He already, well, actually, he did mention turning. He said they turned to God. From what? They're dumb idols. That's what they turned, that's what they turned to God to. What was that? Well, that was turning from sin. I asked a man that, and he wouldn't, didn't want to answer that one time. I asked him about 25 times. Is idol worship sin? Is idol worship sin? Because he said you don't have to turn, you don't have to turn from sin to be saved. You won't turn from sin to be saved. I said, well, is idol worship sin? Over and over again, wouldn't answer me. Why wouldn't he answer me? Well, because if idol worship is sin, then that means he turned from sin. And of course you turn from sin. But salvation is instant. You must understand that. Nobody is saying there's this striving until you're saved. No, salvation is just like that. You're born again by faith in Jesus Christ. And then the fruit of that, of that faith and repentance will show in the life. We can have that argument, but to say that you must work to be saved or add in the law of God to be saved, repentance is not adding the law of God. There are two different things going on there. These are Juda- were Judaizers or like the Hebrew Roots Movement that were trying to add works in. You've got to say something a certain way. You've got to do something a certain way. You've got to follow this ceremony in order, or you cannot be saved. No, Paul said no. For by grace are you saved through faith. Let me say, let me tell you this. If the grace of God is working on you, when you come to Christ, you're going to repent and you're going to believe the gospel. That's that's how it works. Because that's what the grace of God does. Amen. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It's the goodness of God. And it's faith in Jesus Christ alone because there isn't a man alive that can please God in anything he's ever done. Besides Jesus Christ, the Lord is the only one that could ever please God. There's nothing that your your repentance is only a is only a work of the Holy Ghost. It's only a movement of God. It has nothing to do with you and being mighty or anything else like that. And after you're saved and the work that God does in your life is all God. It has nothing to do with your flesh. It has to do with the new man inside of you. When you sin, it's because you give in to the flesh and you walk in the, in the flesh. Christ is our Sabbath. He is our rest. He fulfilled it. But these false brethren, what they do? They crept in and they tried to tell him, hey, you've got to be saved. You've got to keep the law to be saved. Hey, by the way, can I ask you a question? If keeping the law, if, if keeping the law actually saves somebody, if it did, How come Jesus came? If Jesus needed your help for salvation, then why did He come? Why did He shed His blood on an old rugged cross? Why did He give His life a ransom for your soul? Why did did He suffer? Why did He become sin and taste death for every man? Why did He do it if, if if the first covenant was good enough? Read Romans. Read the book of Romans chapter 1 through 4. If it's by faith, then it is no more works. Because works and faith don't mix. Now, the only thing you and I can do is believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and follow God after we've been born again. That's it. Christ is our Sabbath. He's our rest. He fulfilled all righteousness. He's the only one that could. Amen. That doesn't mean that you and I are not, are, are, it's okay if you and I live, live a wicked life and do what we want to do. That's not a saved man. I don't know any saved man that believes that, by the way. I've talked to some, some really, I've talked to some deceived men that say they're saved, but tell me they, that they're living any old way they want to. And hey, I'm going to heaven. I'm just, I'm just struggling while I'm into pornography and drugs and living like the devil and don't care. But hey, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I've talked to people. I've seen people on the street. You've seen people like that. You've talked to people like that. Yep. Oh, I believe. I believe. 
But these these Hebrew roots, these false brethren, they try to return you to the beggarly elements. They try to return you to the old life. They want to take you back to the temple and see you get saved through types and shadows. And believe me, that Hebrew roots movement is huge today. It's it's huge. A man must repent and is led to repent by the preaching of the gospel. The change in his life is not even repentance. It's a result of a man turning from all that he believed in his wicked sins and seeing he is hopeless and without Christ. A hopeless man without Jesus. But there's nothing you and I can do to be saved. But there's a lot that's done in us after we're saved. Amen. That's right. We are... In Romans chapter 3, verse number 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in this sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Listen, these false brethren are those that believe a false gospel. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. He said that twice for a double witness. You see that? So what would that be, the false gospel? Well, that'd be the charismatic movement. They are false brethren. And they will never be allowed to join this church until they repent of their charismatic, maniac stuff. Get born again by the Spirit of God. Admit that to- that the tongues that they are speaking and the way that they are doing is nothing more than a demonic activity or the foolishness of their own heart. That slain in the Spirit and all that garbage, no, they would not be able to come here. We will not accept Pentecostal baptism here either. As 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 baptism, it is not baptism in the eyes of God as far as we're concerned. Amen. Their gospel of being slain in the spirit and the tongues movement, they're false brethren. Next, the gospel of prosperity. God wants you to be rich. No, that's not biblical. That's not the gospel of the Bible. Let it be accursed. They're false brethren. They're not saved. They're not real. The gospel of prosperity. The the JW gospel that they preach... Jesus was just a son of God. He wasn't God. See, there are people that are fooled by that, by the way. that They they are fooled by that and thinking that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are actually preaching the gospel. Because they they talk about the gospel. They never used to. But they talk about the gospel. They even talk about receiving Jesus Christ. If you read their, their works, now they talk about receiving Christ as your Savior. Yeah, they do. Why do they do that? Because they know it's... The, because the fundamentalists made it real easy for him to do it. Because that's all salvation has been is whittled down into a little prayer. So they said, well, hey, I mean, if they can reach that many people whittling salvation down to a prayer, let's just change it and adapt it for us. So the JWs and the Mormons said, oh, we believe Jesus Christ is the Savior. Yeah, but you don't believe he's God. You pin it on him, man, they'll get mad at you. Woo. They get mad at you if you pin it if you pin them on it, they get they get upset. They can't answer you. They can't give an answer. How about the, the, the Roman Catholic gospel? Is the Roman Catholic my brother? No. They're lost. They're lost. Why? Because they follow Jezebel. They follow the, the harlot. I was told, now you, you should, you know... You've got to be careful about what you say about that kind of stuff. You've got to be careful about, about that with, uh, you know, because you don't want to turn, turn away Roman Catholics. <laughs> Listen to me. I'm going to talk about this on Sunday, but Roman Catholics need somebody to tell them the truth. They need somebody to tell them that they've been duped by a lie and, not, and, and, and what they believe is not found in the scriptures. And that the Pope is an antichrist. And the papacy, they're a bunch of devils that have murdered millions of people. You need to be told that. That he's a false prophet. He could be the false prophet. (laughs) And this one's slimier than all the other ones. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, don't be so mean. Well, listen, if it feels like a snake, if it acts like a snake, if it slithers like a snake, then it's a snake. And he's a snake. And somebody can be as mad as they want to at me, but I will call that devil out every chance I get. Because they have led billions of people to hell. Right now, by the way, there's 1.1 billion, 1.2 billion Roman Catholics. And guess what they believe? A lie. The biggest lie ever told. They're the most dangerous cult in the world. They are the mother of all harlots. And this used to not be strange speech. This used to be normal speech for Baptists. And we ought to understand it. But what if it makes somebody mad? Good. Get mad enough to investigate it. And look into it. And I dare you to prove me wrong. I'd love you to prove me wrong about it. Because they are leading more people to hell than any organization ever. And responsible for more harm in the world than any organization ever. And you're going to find out on Sunday that there are so many churches and so many people that are so linked up to them that they don't ever speak against Rome. I mean, they partner up with the Pope when he comes to America, and they're all excited to meet him. They, all these, all these Baptists, I mean, the Northern Baptist Convention or something like that here two weeks ago, just, they're excited about the Pope and they wanted to meet him or something, have a, we gotta talk about, I don't have anything to talk to him about. The only thing I would say to him, look at him and say, you are a devil. That's it. That's that's it. Repent. You're going to die and go to hell. And you're leading millions with you. Billions. Come on. How nice can you be to somebody who's impersonating God anyway? How nice can you actually be to someone who is impersonating God? He says he's God. And he worships a woman. How lame and effeminate can you be? They're false brethren. They're not real. The people won't tell. Oh, I think there's. I think there's a whole lot of Roman Catholics that are saved. I don't, because I don't know anybody with the Holy Ghost of God inside them that would just sit in a Roman Catholic church and be like, "Yeah, I'm Catholic. This is cool." Oh, look, it's Jesus in a wafer. It's the way for God. Really? What born again creature of Christ with the Holy Ghost inside of them would do that? And walk around watching men look like women in dresses and all that, the weird stuff they do. Come on, what saved person would do that? I just I just don't believe any of that. I, I don't believe that. I believe what the Bible says. Come out from among her, my people. Come out from among her. Be ye not a partaker of her evil deeds. Amen? Anyway, I I can't get off on that. I'm going to be on that on Sunday, so I'm almost done here. But but that's, how about this? How about the Duck Dynasty Church of Christ gospel? False brethren. Baptismal regeneration. By the way, did you know that's a daughter of Rome? That's where that comes from. Anybody who makes baptism part of salvation, they're a daughter of Rome. That's where that comes from. Because that's what Rome does. They just sprinkle. But they do the same thing. They think there's power in the tub. That's what they think. Yeah. Not in the blood, but in the tub. Like that water. Like God would leave salvation up to you and I 
in the sense of holding the power of it that you must be baptized by me in order to be saved. Come on, really? So what if you can never find somebody to baptize you? You just die and go to hell? Well, that's wonderful. That's a great gospel. <laughs> yeah, it's sick. What is it? Control. It's control. That's what it is. But it's a false gospel. This is what I say, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. They're not saved and they don't believe the Bible. They truly believe in a works-based salvation. They are the mother of all harlots. And these are their children. But there is a true gospel that's found in the Scriptures. Now, also, these false brethren, you'll notice that Paul says they came out to spy out liberty. Like I said, I do believe there'll come a time when that will take place, when they will spy out, when they will look at, when they will look into churches. I, Jesuits have been doing it for years. Jesuit priests have set up and they have been into churches for years. Oh, you don't really believe that, do you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. No, I do. I believe Jesuit priests topple governments. I believe they're part of spy organizations. I believe they deal with all of them. Oh, come on. Yeah, I know. I actually believe that there's a mother of all harlots. And I actually believe that she has a lot of power in this world. And I actually believe that she is setting up for a one world religion and monetary system. And I believe it's coming soon. And I believe the Pope even talks about it and looks at people and says it. And they just play on their cell phone and do something else and don't, don't even pay attention to it. There are many, and, and Jesuits have admitted to sending people into churches to spy out and to cause trouble. You say, do I believe it could happen here? Sure I do. Sure, I believe it. I wouldn't be surprised if the government doesn't send people our way. would surprise me. Doesn't it scare you? No, not really. I'm no threat to them. Unless the Bible's a threat to them. But I'm not. I wouldn't lay a finger on anybody. No, just preach. You know why? Because the battle is of the Lord. The battle is for the book. The battle is with the book. It's not with flesh and blood. See, I realize how absolutely inco inconsequential these people actually are. Insignificant they really are. They're just faces. It's the spirit behind them that is dangerous. That's the spirit that is anti-Christ and the spirit that hates. Second Timothy chapter 2, 19, and we're finished. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen? Nevertheless, I like that, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal. What is the seal? The Lord knoweth them that are His. And the proper order, then it says this, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. False brethren, oh yeah, they're everywhere. you got your Joel Olsteins, your charismatic movement, your Billy Grahams, and many, 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 many more. And I believe they're false brethren. And I believe they're out there and they're deceiving the masses. And I believe they want to bring come into churches and I believe they do want to cause trouble. They want to bring their doctrine with them. And I believe in these end times that the that that this one world religion is going to use these false brethren. And already are using them, by the way. When you see some of the number one, like Catherine Kuhlman and some of the number one charismatics that were out there at the time, back in the 80s and that, and they, and they, they had audiences with the Pope. And you see men like Jack Van Empey who have audiences with the Pope. 
And you have all these mainliners having audiences with the Pope, W.A. Criswell and men, old Baptists like that that were starting to have Jerry Falwell. All these men having, having audiences with the Pope. Why? Why would you ever, what, what would you have to say to him? What possibly could you have to say to him? Besides a burning desire to scream at him. The one that's responsible for the blood of the martyrs, the blood of the saints. The institution that is. It just baffles me. But false brethren, they're out there. There's some that are Baptists that are false, that aren't really real. I think Westboro Baptists, that Fred Phelps and those guys, I think they were nothing more than Cointel Pro. I think they were just operatives is all they were. Out there to make people look bad. Out there to make Baptists look bad. I think there's street preachers out there that are the same way. Percy, I think Reuben Israel is one of them. That'll make me a lot of fans. But I, I, but, uh, but I, I think he's one of them. I don't care who knows it. I don't care if it bothers anybody. I really personally think he is. I think there's others like him, just like him out there, just causing trouble around the country and doing it on purpose and trying to make preachers look bad for a reason. I think there's another guy out in Arizona that might be one too. But I don't know. If I had to guess, if you're going to work with Alex Jones, I would say, well, let me just say it. I think Stephen Anderson might be one, too. Because if I'm going to work that closely with Alex Jones, who has the spirit of Antichrist in him, who is not a saved man, who has Satanists that link up to him and he sells his videos along with those Satanists along on that website with him, I have to wonder something. I have to wonder, why would he want to yoke up with him? Weird. Weird. Why would you want to do that? For the love of money is the root of all evil? I don't know. Maybe. Why would you want to yoke up with somebody that doesn't believe the Bible, that pushes a different agenda, that is clearly, clearly not saved, and to me has Jesuit leanings? Why? Why would you want to do that? Hmm. Interesting. But I believe there's false brethren out there. And then, those kind of people like to put you on a blacklist. That same man put me on a blacklist for preaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 